Um, so I don't have any math. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm, but so the good news is, if you struggle, if you struggle with the math, it's okay. You can still understand how intelligence works without understanding how to navigate gradient descent through backpropagation through a neural network. So, um, I, again, I should probably note that um, I'm live streaming this. Thanks to the viewers who's watching. There's been about 40 people watching this as we've been presenting, so thank you all for joining. Um, whenever I have like a group of people in front of me, I always like to ask this question. How many of you think human beings are intelligent? Raise your hand if you think human beings are intelligent. Please, I mean, everybody should have their hand up. And watch the hands go down. How many think chimpanzees are intelligent? How many people think dogs? <laughs> Let's say, in general, dogs. Who says dogs have intelligence? Okay, just look, look around. Most of the people who say dogs. Cats? <laughs> More hands just went up for that. <laughs> okay, um, rats and mice, let's say, rodents. Most hands are still up. Okay, let's talk about um, a lizard. Would you say a lizard is intelligent? An iguana or something like that? The, the point of this exercise is that everyone has different uh, uh, definitions of intelligence. Let's keep going. Grasshopper. Who thinks of grasshopper as intelligent? How about an ant? Colony. <laughs> Tricky, right? <laughs> um, who believes that an amoeba is intelligent? There's still some hands up. Who believes that plants are intelligent? There's, there are more people think plants than amoebas. That's amazing. Okay, so there's a there's this big, big, broad definition of intelligence that everybody's going to tell you something different. So. Um, I'm going to define intelligence in, in, a, in basically by trying to explain how the brain exhibits what anyone would call intelligent behavior. Um, this is uh, all biological. I am going to do a quick review of deep learning because we just sort of seen deep learning. That was a very simplified, simple. I mean, the math is hard, right? But that was the simplest way to understand all of the math. Is what he just gave you, <laughs> and. Um, it's super hard to understand that. I went through this process a couple years ago because I thought maybe I'm missing something. I thought I understood you know, a lot of things about the brain. Maybe there is something in, in deep learning networks that I'm missing that's gonna to lead to AGI. And so I took the courses, I studied it, and I didn't think, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so how close are we to AGI? From the deep learning perspective, I'm gonna point out a few things that just um, really sort of make it poignant how how deep learning fails. And I'm not doing this to be mean, I'm just doing this to be realistic. Um, so this is an adversarial attack. Um, all deep learning networks are susceptible to some type of adversarial attack. In the, in the uh, case of an image recognition network, there is some combination of input to the system that will short circuit it. Um, and if attackers can find some combination of this input, they have the ability to short circuit the system. Um, and the tricky thing is, look at the randomness of this thing, right? This, um, that means there's a lot of random combinations that could potentially short-circuit short the system if something weird comes up that's never seen before, no combination of anything. So it just kind of shows you that there are inherent flaws in this, in the landscape of deep learning, because it's, it's really built on mathematics. And, and a lot of the models that get created um, can be referred to as brittle in some ways, in that if you show it something outside of the set of things it's ever seen before, it will fail catastrophically, right? Um, yeah, uh, here's another example of um, adversarial noise. You can apply noise to images that humans can't even see that will cause uh, classification networks to fail. And this isn't just for images, this is for all types of deep learning networks, the ones that process voice input, um, because they're all essentially doing the same mechanism that Robbie just told you, and that is what's being attacked, that mechanism. Uh, one more, probably the most dangerous one, is a misclassification of a stop sign as a 45 mile per hour sign. Um, reinforcement, and this, this really drives home, if you know what reinforcement learning is, it's, it's sort of the, uh, the current technology that allows you to get mo motion into the system, some form of movement or agency into a system, and there's this field of deep learning called deep reinforcement learning. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and 
it, these systems are extremely susceptible to adversarial attacks because every component that builds up a representation using these, these gradient descent methods are, an, are a possible way that, that it can be attacked. And if you're moving through space and time as an agent, everything you're seeing is, is, a, is a surface area for attack. It's just, um, our brains don't work like this. There are, you can short circuit human brains for sure, but they're certainly not as easily fooled as these systems. I probably should have said, I work for Numenta. My name's Matt Taylor. <laughs> I just sort of went right into this and started talking about intelligence. Um, I am the community manager for a company in Silicon Valley called Numenta. My company was founded to try and understand how intelligence works in the brain and build systems built upon those principles. Um, so we've been around since 2005, and we've learned a lot about the brain, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about, what we've learned about the brain. Um, one more example of deep learning. Again, this is, did you guys see Alpha Star? So Alpha, this is insane. Like the things you can do with deep learning are insane. And you're gonna keep seeing things like this happen. So uh, was it DeepMind? DeepMind decided to create an AI that could play StarCraft II. And so they did and, they, and it, it's basically beat every human StarCraft II player on the planet. <laughs> like it is really good. Um, so they've got it out there, like on the servers. It's out there. You can go play it. Like you can go play this AI and lose yourself if you want to feel awful about humanity. Um, but the thing is about this agent, it all it can do is play StarCraft II. You know, it can't really do anything else. That that knowledge of, if you want to call it knowledge of the StarCraft II universe, doesn't transfer anywhere. Um, and the amount of training that this thing took, I'll say to you this. I actually saw this in a. A presentation from a deep mind engineer that worked on the project. The, the agent that ended up beating all those humans, 600,000 years of like in game playing. If you, were to, if you were to make the computer play it like in human time, 600,000 years. So you imagine how bad it is for the first several hundred thousand years. Right? <laughs> we humans don't learn that way. It's just, it's not the way that we learn. Um, and even these things are also susceptible to adversarial attacks. If you knew how this system was architectured, and there's a whole paper about it online, you could figure out how to do it. <laughs> okay, so I'm telling you that deep learning is not going to lead to AGI. Why not, right? Okay, there's two big things. The main thing is that the perceptron, the point neuron at the core of deep learning, is a little bit too simple. So all of these deep learning networks that Robbie talked about are layers and layers and layers, and they all have units, and each unit is uh, inspired by a neuron. Um, and the, of course, these things were built back in, in the 60s and 70s. You know, these ideas were emerged way back then. Um, and it's only been until now when we've had the massive amount of compute power to actually do things with them. Uh, so this perceptron neuron is vastly too simple. It's, it's basically one unit is a sum of the weights from the previous layer, and you, you run an activation function over it. Actual pyramidal neurons in your brain are more complicated than that, probably vastly so. We at least know that a neuron in the brain doesn't work like that at all. It, at least it, it reacts differently when it gets synaptic input close to the cell body than it does when it gets synaptic input far away from the cell body, than it does when it gets synaptic input from the apical tuft, which is feedback. So there's a lot more going on in a pyramidal neuron. Um, we have a model for this neuron that we've used since 2010, and it, what it enables is, is a network to learn with a context. In our case, learn with a temporal context, which means the state of the network learns by looking at the state of itself over time. That's what this context is. This is the input. This is like the world coming out the neuron, and this is contextual information. And this can be vast. Like this, this network right here is distal segments of thousands of, of hundreds of synapses. Um, so this thing acts like a coincidence detector. So when it sees all that, if it sees input on these far away dendritic uh, uh, segments, it can, it can inform the cell that it's about to fire next. That's what this context is doing. So pyramidal neurons actually can go into a predictive state where their voltage increase is not enough to fire an active uh, a, uh, a, a spike, but enough that it will beat all of its neighbors from firing. And this is, again, we have lots of theory about this at my company. We think this is how 
um, sequences are learned in the brain, which is really important. The second thing that's missing, aside from the neuron model, you have a question? Uh, yes, I if you were going to play a slide, but you learn what it's all, but you collect information, but you do not refer to the next neuron. Oh, absolutely. Yes, we do. All the neurons are interconnected together. But in your flight, it's uh, no output. This, this is the output is the activation of the cell body. There's an axon that comes out of the cell and goes to other uh, other places in the cortex or other Yeah, that that the the action potential gets transmitted over the axon to other other cells that are listening on their dendritic segments, um, and that can go all over the place, uh, depending on where it's where it is in the brain, what type of cell it is, etc. Yeah. Um, okay, so. The other thing that we're missing from these deep learning models, and this may seem strange at first, but it's the idea of movement and time as a core representation of reality. So can anyone think of anything that is intelligent that does not move through space? Core uh, time? What, what? Just time. If you take uh, Einstein model, time doesn't have uh, space. Is that intelligence? <laughs> the Borg. The Borg. Well, it moves, right? They, they, they move. Everything moves. Everything that has intelligence moves. Let, let, me, let me give this to you another way. And I say time because the brain sees movement in the same way that it sees time. Sure. A computer, a theoretically intelligent computer, would be moving. Well, we don't have theoretically intelligent computers. <laughs> oh, let's think about moving in a different way. It doesn't have to be physical movement. Right, so all you need to be able to do is take an action that changes the perspective of your sensor in your environment. That's movement. So now we need to talk about how brains represent space and time. I'm telling you how important space and time are. Um, so let's go way, 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 way back. I know we're, we're, we want to nail down like human level intelligence, but to get to this core mechanism, it's like so important that we need to go way back to like the beginning of life before brains, where we really just have these sort of, uh, these agents that just have uh, neurons that are like photoreceptive or chemical receptive and other neurons that do some motor control. I think about very simple organisms that basically are already locomoting through whatever primordial ooze is they're, they're existing in, right? Locomotion comes before intelligence. Locomotion exists before we, need, before we have neurons that have to take action, because that's what they evolved to do. You have to have some form of locomotion. So in the very simplest ideas of, of how this evolved, we have some simple organism, some type of external stimulus that indicates something good that I want to go to or something bad that I want to get away from. That chemical trail, or that, whatever that is, the, this thing learns that when it, when it sees that, it, it activates this motion and it gets the hell out of dodge. Or it sees that and it activates this motion and it goes and eats its dinner. This is how core this idea of movement and space is. Intelligence, the, the very emergence of intelligence as a survival uh, uh, strategy already involves space, an object, and a movement associated with it. So these are like the core primitive ideas, I think, of how to define what intelligence is, at least in biological systems. We also know, so we also know of the existence of uh, location-based cells in the brain. Um, in 2014, the Nobel Prize was given for, for this discovery of, of something called grid cells. There's different types of these cells that we found in cortex, hippocampus and intraorenal cortex. And they, they respond to where the, an organism is in a room. And they seem to map out space. Um, they, they, they do map out space. Like we've done, when, when people realized this, they were like, holy oh, shit. Sure. <laughs> right? And so they did a bunch more experiments. And this is a real thing. Like you have neurons in your brain that fire in a certain pattern as you walk across the room and keeps track of where you are in your environment. And they do the same thing whether you're in this room or another room or another room. They are generic space mapping 
neurons. They're, they're things that respond to just space and where you are in it. So we think this is a core mechanism to intelligence. I'm telling you how important space is and time is to the brain. We see there's a way the brain's representing space. And the way that we see it doing it, it can do it one-dimensionally, it can do it two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, and dimensionally. Like this mechanism allows the brain to represent n-dimensional space. And that kind of blows your mind, if you think about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna show you some brain diagrams now. Um, <clears throat> we don't have to understand all this, but so this is a very old relative of ours, an ancestral vertebrate. This is before the explosion of the mammalian neocortex, okay? So this is, we, we have cortex up here, but it's, it's not necessarily the neocortex because it hasn't exploded. But even in this simple organism, um, and this, is, this schematic sort of shows you the size of the different brain regions and how they're connected, but it's not actually like anatomically correct, but it's more of a schematic view. Um, but these areas that I've circled up here, that's where we think, well, that's where in today's mice, we've seen those location cells. So if you were to, to trace mice all the way back, the area of the brain that we see that is, is right there. I bet that even way back then, this stuff was happening back there. I bet this originated when we were all just little tadpoles going through the primordial soup. We started mapping space then. What we have now is this really sophisticated system of mapping space. Because what happens over 500 million years, from, from watch the, this green dorsal pallium, it expands to take up 70% of your brain. So something really, nature doesn't do this unless something really good is happening in that substrate. This whole green area up there is almost entirely homogenous. I mean like if you poke a pin in this part of your brain, and this part, and this part, and this part, and this part, you'd have to have a pretty good neuroscientist to be able to tell you which part of the brain they just probed. Like if they could, they could look at the structure of it, your neocortex, this green part that's doing all these different things, is essentially running the same cortical function all throughout the whole thing. That seems important. And I think that this explosion, this was so useful. Let me explain how useful this is. What, what, we basic, what the brain basically did here is said, I've developed this mechanism to map my agent in space, you know, my, who, where I am in space. But as the brain expanded, and as mammals in particular started evolving dexterous fingers and vocal cords that could really evoke different types of sounds, these space mapping cells and the circuits they were involved in evolved to start representing all objects, all objects that we interact with. So now it's not just where am I in the room that I'm in, it's where is my finger on the object that I'm moving across. So this core mechanism that we find working in, in mice and rats in the interrhinal cortex and hippocampus, we believe has been, has been hijacked in some way by evolution way, way back in the timeline and evolved into what we think is happening in neocortex right now. And that's where all of our detailed memory about every object that we've ever interacted with is stored. This is, this cortical column, this is a, a term, an old neuroscience term. This unit that I keep talking about that is, a, is replicated throughout the neocortex is called a cortical column. What we do at my company, since I've worked there, is try to figure out how this works. Because the cortical column is complicated, it's, it's six to 10 layers, depending on who you talk to. There's a bunch of different cell types in there and they're all piped into other layers in different areas of the cortex, in different places of the brain, in different layers. It goes through the thalamus. It's complicated. This is a messy system. Um, a little pitch for my company. I live stream all of our research meetings. This is one of the things we do. We research the neuroscience. Like We just had a research meeting this morning. We were talking about grid cell firing, a hybrid mechanism of grid cell firing using continuous tractor networks or oscillatory interference dynamics. So that's the sort of research meetings that, that we have, and we do this pretty much every week. If you're interested in this stuff, and you want to learn more, 
my company is very transparent about everything that we do. So, quick pitch. So this thousand brains idea, that's, like, that's what we like to call it. That's, that's our, our marketing pitch, the thousand brains idea, right? That every cortical column in your cortex is essentially doing the same thing, that we can try and simplify the, the basic function of intelligence down to this one sensory motor loop. And the sensory motor part is important, and, and that's coming. All throughout our brain, all these different parts of the cortex are functionally different. They're doing different things. There's language areas and speech generation areas, auditory areas. But we, we think if we can figure out this core algorithm, it will inform us on all of the brain. The hierarchy of the brain. You didn't really talk much about hierarchy in deep learning networks, but it's very important in deep learning networks to learn structures of things to have a hierarchy. You, and, and that's inspired directly by uh, neocortical hierarchy in neuroscience as well. There is a hierarchy in your brain, and, and this is what it looks like. It's really messy, and it's really confusing, and neuroscientists have been trying to figure out how it works for like decades and decades. It's not deep, it's wide, and it's really, really scattered, right? There's connections going all over the place. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And we think that at every level of the hierarchy, the same essential function is, is going on. So, I'm going to do a hierarchy example. This is what people think the hierarchy does in the brain. Okay, but this is not what, how hierarchy works. This is like the deep learning model of hierarchy that you might have learned in textbooks and stuff. I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to show you why, the, why, how it really works in the brain. So in a deep learning hierarchy, when you're sending input into like the first layer, um, you only send input to the first layer. There's, uh, there's more complicated models where you get level skipping and, and resonance and stuff that try and do tricky things. But for the most part, you send input into the bottom layer. The bottom layer, in, in the case of image classification, it's just an example, the bottom layer will, will do basic feature extraction. It will try to identify low-level features, edges, and points, and dots, and things like that. And then it passes its new representation to the layer above it. And we ascend the hierarchy, right? As you go up the hierarchy, the, the theory is that the layer above will take those, those components and compose them in, in a logical way. Uh, in, in the horse idea, you know, taking some of these edges and turning them into feet and legs and torso or whatever. And then as you get to the top, that's where the, don't ignore that. That's, this is from a video, I make videos. Um, at the top, you actually get the, the object that's being classified. So uh, this is how all of the, the machine learning textbooks show hierarchy, but it's, and it's, it's actually not even this clean. If you look into real neural networks, you can't like look at one that has no spaces and see noses at some point, that everything gets mangled and mashed together. So there's no logical composition of features like a human would do, right? Um, but Okay, so the brain's different. Um, this is a bit of a toy example, but, I, but everything I'm going to say here is, I think, factually true. Um, in the brain, I'm going to use the, the visual cortex as an example. Input flows feed forward into multiple areas of the hierarchy. Okay, it doesn't just go to the bottom, it goes several up. And, and what I've got here is like, this is an example of one cortical column in, let's say, V1, you know, the very, the very bottom of the hierarchy. At that level, that cortical column gets some of the input to process, okay? It gets a field of view of the space. At the bottom of the hierarchy, the field of view, and you can do this yourself, is, is about the size of your thumb at arm's length. So in V1, which is right here, the back of your head, you're only processing about the size of your thumbnail, but it's very highly detailed. I mean, you, 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 can get, you can read a piece of paper, right, at arm's length. So that's all that bottom part of the hierarchy is getting. As you go up, the field of view of the sensory input broadens. So as you go up the visual hierarchy, uh, you get a broader field of view, but the detail is blurrier. You get less detail. And again, we'll send one more at the, at the higher region of the hierarchy, and you just see it's blurry. The same thing, broader less detail. So the interesting thing about this is all of these columns, 
all of them, every point in the hierarchy, no matter what they're connected to, they're all doing the same things. They're all doing the same thing. They're trying to like resolve to an, to an idea. Right? When we're like, I like to take the example of if you if you're inspecting a new an object and you don't know what it is, um, you dedicate all of your senses toward it, right? You 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 explore the thing, you move around it, you look at it in all these different ways. You're moving your sensors at all the different layer levels of your hierarchy across an object and writing sensory input tied to locations in space into the synapses in your brain. That's how you, that's how you learn objects, through sensory motor exploration. Of course, there's more to it to that. You know, there's, a, there's, there's a sleep cycle involved, and, and, but at a, at a very basic level, that's what you're doing. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make it seem, the hierarchy is definitely important, but it's not as important as we think it is, okay? The, the hierarchy is like the purple stuff here. All of these cortical columns have massive amounts of lateral connections, like layer two, three, layer five, layer, layer six, they all have these cortical, cortical connections that some of them will go huge areas across the brain and connect to some cortical column on the other side of the brain. Why is it doing that? <laughs> Well, I think one of the reasons it's doing that is because if one of these cortical columns has an idea about what something is, and it's connected with all these parts all around the brain, all of them can then vote together. And then so if one part of your visual field, one cortical column dealing with part of visual field, has an idea about what an object is, it spreads like fire through the cortex. You know, it's, it, it goes all over because there's all of these different lateral connections. It goes up the hierarchy, down, it goes all over the place. So you don't have to think, well, we're, the object's going to form down at the bottom of the hierarchy and travel all the way up or at the bottom and come down. It's very likely just whatever figures it out first transmits that to all of its neighbors that it's, that it's sharing its dendritic synapses with, or its axons with. <coughs> So who cares about all this stuff, right? Um, this is like all theory, this, um, and there's more to it. I'm, I mean, we, we're talking a lot about thalamus now. Next week, I'm going to give a whole presentation about how how the pulvinar thalamus is, could be involved in propagating error across cortex in some way. But what can we do right now, uh, and in, especially in, in deep learning, uh, because that's what everybody's doing. Um, so we asked this question too, because honestly, we've been we've been studying the brain and trying to figure this out for so long, and nobody's paid any attention. And so we're like, well, what could we do? And let's make let's do something in deep learning. So so we said, what is it in the brain that is that is that makes it really powerful? What is it that we could take from what we know about the brain and apply to these deep networks that uh, Rob was just talking about? Um, and there's and I think there's there's a few things, but the first I'm only going to talk about one. And it's this idea of sparsity. So I didn't have a slide about this, and I, I kind of regret it now. Um, because sparsity is really important in your brain. When I say sparse representations, I mean like when you think of uh, your Aunt Mildred or, or whoever, when you think about somebody, you, there's, a certain, there's a certain neural code you know, that, that comes on in your brain. You have neurons that represent that thought somehow. But no matter what you're thinking about, only about 2% of the neurons in your brain are ever active at any one time. So your brain keeps everything tamped down. No matter how much stimulus you're getting, or how, no matter how bright the light is, or how loud the sound is, your brain has a normalization function. And it keeps everything sparse. And the sparsity is actually important. So when you look at neural representations for objects, they're distributed across broad ranges of neocortex. They're not just localized in one place. You'll have the um, vocalization motor commands for how to say dog in one part of your brain, and you'll have the, the auditory recognition for hearing the word dog in another part of your brain. You'll have um, sensations for dog hair in another part of your brain. Those, all those things come together to form your representation of what dog means to you, and it's all based on your sensory experience with dogs your whole life. That's your representation of dog. And it's all very sparse, and it's all very associative. So if you were to take your representation of dog out of your brain, 
and put it somewhere. This wouldn't work between people, but within one person it would. If you could take your dog representation and your cat representation and compare them together, you would see that they would overlap in the places where both dogs and cats are furry mammals and have tails and have ears and breathe and are living things, right? But they would not overlap in the parts where dogs bark and cats meow and cats are finicky and dogs are overly emotional and, you know, whatever. <laughs> so we, we were, anyway, my point is we wrote this paper called How Could We Be So Dense? The benefits of using sparse representations, and this is all about how to take neural networks standard sort of vanilla neural networks, like convolu convolutional neural nets, nets, excuse me. So we took like MNIST and the Google speech data sets, some of the basic data sets that everybody goes and does machine learning stuff on. We took the best um, examples of standard convolutional neural networks for those networks, and we made them sparse. So there's a certain way you can apply sparsity uh, that the brain does it. And so we made it sparse in that way. In a neural network where you've got layer, 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 and they can have thousands and thousands of units in those layers or hundreds or whatever, but they're all densely connected to the next. Every single neuron in every single layer in a standard uh, deep learning network has a connection to every neuron in the layer before it. And there's a, there's a weight associated with that, and there's an activation function that decides whether that neuron is going to be active in the next stage or not. Um, so what, we just, what we're doing is basically cutting the majority of those entirely. Because we know that um, you don't really need them. So there, there's, a, there's been some deep learning studies. Um, you could look up things like the lottery ticket hypothesis is, is one thing to look up. But where if you, ha if you find the neural network and you already trained it, right, and it's really running well, you can go through the, the networks and, and zero out a majority of the weights and it will still perform well, <laughs> which, is, which is crazy, right? But it proves the point. There's a lot of stuff going on there that doesn't necessarily contribute to the accuracy of the model. And if we could find a way to apply that sparsity in a logical way that doesn't lose resolution of the system as it's trying to model whatever it's training on, then we're going to come out with deep, deep networks that have a, a vast fraction of the computational cost and power usage when we're training them. So that's the focus that my company is, is on right now, is how can we make realistic uh, deep learning networks and make them easy to make sparse, and so that they'll run much faster and with much less computational uh, power required. Um, you get an added bonus with this, um, because sparsity just gives you fault tolerance and noise tolerance for free. That's just the way neurons work. So, uh, so this is a the standard CNN, and then one where we applied sparsity to it, and then I just fed in MNIST, random MNIST with noise, and the sparsely connected one always does better with noise. And and I did this because I expected it. If you think about neurons in your brain, um, you add noise to an image, uh, you ignore the noise, right? The, the semantics of the image are still present in the neural activations, even with, with noise, and you can still pick that out. Does that include adverse <coughs> Adverse, probably not, no. I don't know how you can fix that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, you know, it might do better versus adversarial attacks, but we haven't done any uh, research on it. Okay. I haven't even thought about it. Um, okay, so there's a couple more slides about the future. Um, this is something I'm very excited about. I think this is the future of AI, and I think it'll make, um, I think it'll it'll change the playing field. So all of the GPUs that we use today to train deep learning networks um, are really efficient. They were built in a way, you know, by Nvidia or whoever to do this type of dense matrix calculation that's required for, for backpropagation. Um, and they're, they're, they're very good at that, but if we can, but if the, I'm saying the future is sparse computation, right? The, so we already can make these models sparse and prove that it takes fewer computations, fewer, less training time, et cetera. But that doesn't amount to anything until we have hardware that can take advantage of the sparse computations. So uh, we are looking forward to um, developments in the neuromorphic, neuromorphic hardware uh, scene, which is really hopping right now. Um, 
And what they're going to do is they're going to start making chips that, uh, that have dense representations, are able to have dense representations. You can do this on GPUs, but it's just super inefficient. They're, they're not meant to process data like brains, for sure. Brains are very, very distributed. Um, so once these chips start hitting the market, three to five years, sometimes it's decade, we're going to have, I think, neuromorphic chips uh, that can handle sparse computations. This is going to level the playing field for the AI industry. So I think it's going to mean that um, many more AI startups will be able to get into the research business again, because uh, right now it's, it's very hard to do real AI research with real live models, with real data, because it takes such a long time. Like, r ridiculous amounts of, of time and compute and training, et cetera. You, that's why we have like the Googles and Amazons and, and Facebooks are all leading the charge in AI because they have all of the compute power. Once we get sparse computing on ships, this is gonna level the playing field so that we can have the smaller shops and the smaller startups do some real AI research. So I'm really looking forward to this. Yes. Are hardware companies actively working on that? Definitely. I can tell you at least of one called Rain Neuromorphics. R-A-I-N. <laughs> I know, you know, you never know. <laughs> okay, uh, last slide and then we'll, you know, I'll take questions and discuss. Um, so I, I really believe in sparsity. I think that's going to make a big impact in deep learning. And I also think it's going to get us some attention because we're, all, we're saying this is all brain inspired. The only reason we did this was just to prove that it, may, it means something. Brain research means something. <laughs> so I think this is going to make a splash as the hardware appears, and hopefully we'll get some of the big companies doing AI research coming back and, and looking again at the brain and how does the brain compute and how can we create systems that are more like it. Um, deep learning is it has a lot of legs left. So I'm not saying deep learning is dead. You, you can, I, I swear, if you put your mind to it, you could do anything with deep learning if you have enough time and compute power. Um, so. There's going to be a whole swath of new applications, a whole new uh, swath of innovations. People are like just digging through the math bucket right now. Let's like try, what can I do to optimize this? Like, what's the next big thing? And it is, it's like a huge toolbox full of functions. <laughs> um, so I don't think though that deep learning is going to lead to strong AI or AGI. Um, there are people in the field that do believe that, like uh, Jan LeCun, Facebook AI. Um, to some extent, Yashua, Bengio, but I have never seen that. I, I just, I don't think it's gonna happen. Like I said, you need real neurons, or at least better neurons, and you need movement. You, you need to understand that time and space is sort of the construct upon which we build our simulation of the world, and the brain is a simulation that you're constantly running, essentially. Um, so my company is gonna keep researching brains, and if you wanna keep up with what we're doing, subscribe to our YouTube channel, because we're live streaming on it right now. <laughs> All right, so I'll take questions. Yeah. How is sparse different from pruning? How is sparse different from pruning? So you could uh, uh, attempt to prune in order to make a representation sparse, but there's different methods you can use for pruning. Uh, so you have to decide which weights you want to prune, and that means you have to decide which ones are meaningful to the system. And that's a tricky thing to do, right? You don't want to prune weights. That, is, that are contributing to the accuracy of the model. Um, so there's uh, several different mechanisms for pruning. Um, what we do uh, to try to apply sparsity is, is something different. We apply something called, um, uh, well, in, our, in the brain speak, in our theory, it's called spatial pooling. And in machine learning speak, I would probably call it a K-winners take all activation, okay? <laughs> um, but with uh, an additional level of homeostasis applied. Um, so when you have a K-winner, so there's two different ways to, to, there's actually like six different types of sparsity. But the, the main ones that we're applying to deep learning is sparse weights and sparse activations. So the pruning would be, I think, pruning the weights, and then the activations are another way to apply sparsity. Um, if you do random pruning, that's one way to do it, uh, but uh, it can degrade your model. So the way we do it, is we let, uh, we, we, uh, we activate, or excuse me, we cut all of the weights, like we zero out uh, most of the weights up front, 
and that's just static. We leave it static throughout the whole training of the system. Um, and then and we train uh, the weights off of that, and then we activate the layers based on the K-winner's take-all activation, which only allows a certain subset of the uh, units in the layer to represent that input. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? I, uh, I'm wondering if like, this sparse computing like, requires less data yeah. compared to the traditional in, in the well, so there's in, in the way we're applying it to deep learning, no, because we can't make deep learning better in that way. Uh, but okay. in the way that it applies to your brain, absolutely. Uh, but it's so not about the sparsity. That's not what makes it that way. Yeah. So like my uh, uh, my concern is so basically, let's say, uh, so the sparse computing is more like let's say we uh, you develop a, a food processor to chop cauliflower. And the traditional deep learning is just you use a knife to chop it. But we still need the cauliflower, which I need the data, yeah. to, to prepare a meal. So yeah. if it still requires the same amount of data, still doesn't solve the problem of Amazon, Facebook, and all the big giants are doing it because you don't have the cauliflower. You know, the, the sparsity is not going to help the cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> it, it won't reduce. It doesn't reduce the amount of training data uh -huh. that you need to push through it. It reduces the amount of t training time it takes uh -huh. to push through it. Okay. So you're still going to need, a, as far as I understand, it, the same amount of data to get the same results. Uh -huh. Now that, but again, that's not how your brain works. Your brain doesn't need lots and lots and lots of data. Yeah. It has like one-shot learning, instantaneous learning. You, if yeah. you learn thing one, you can learn something once and never forget it again. But you know that's a different type of learning entirely. Okay. Yeah. Do you know specifically how it works? How the brain does it? It's called Hebbian learning. Uh, it's uh, there's a lot of different types of Hebbian learning throughout the brain. It's, uh, I don't think I can go into it right now, but it's a localized yeah. form of learning where there's like a post and a pre synapse that can, and either one can be reinforced. So that's how local learning works in cortex. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when you say sparse, I think sparse file system and, and a hash table. So the more buckets you have, the easier to look, to look up. Uh, that is, are you saying that's the same concept or no? You, you, the more buckets you have, the easier it is to look up. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the same concept. Um, <laughs> uh, so you have to think of semantics. When you think about sparse representations, it helps to think about semantics. Every representation in your brain has semantic meaning. Um, that's one of the things that we miss out in, in the ANN world, because if you take a representation out of an ANN, it doesn't mean anything, even to itself. It doesn't mean anything. Um, if you take a representation in your brain, there's a semantic meaning to it. And if you take another representation, you can, should be able to compare them to tell how similar they are, right? And the sparseness, is, is just, it opens up the playing field. So if, if you have a data structure that's five bits wide, you know, and you only put, a, if, and you put a bit, and you could put a bit in each one of them, that's five to the power of two. But as you make that thing really big, there's a sweet spot, right? Around, you know, around several thousand units um, where um, you computationally can represent anything in the known universe, right? But, but just by turning these bits on and off. You have the space in your neural representations to represent an infinite, essentially infinite amount of things. That's why you can always continue to learn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned that uh, in, in your brain, you can compare the cat and dog uh, network. Does that mean that uh, this the AGI might require thousands and thousands of different networks all working together? Uh, no. So the so the the way I see network, um, I think a better word for that would be attractor. Um, if you're familiar with the term, I like to think of neural representations in the brain as an attractor. An attractor is a is a pattern that has a sort of an ability to self complete if you invoke a portion of it. And um, so I like to think of neural representations like cat as an attractor that's distributed throughout your brain. This is just me, okay? This is like a official Nementa theory. <laughs> I just I like to talk about brains. Um, but so if you reach into a box and you want to figure out what it is, and you feel something that feels like a cat, only the part of cortex that's responding to this part of your, these part of your fingers that are touching the cat 
are, are making that decision, are making that call as they're touching the thing, that invokes an attractor throughout the brain, right? That, that thing that's like, oh, it's fuzzy, it might be a cat or a dog, and then the cat pushes up against your hand, and you're like, that's a cat, right? That, that's the type of um, a tra relationship, representation. It's sparse because you don't have to store a lot of data just to, to say something is furry or fuzzy or not. You don't have to remember every single hair that you touch when you're petting a, an animal. No. So I think that's, that's the way I like to think about it. And if you think about it that way, the cat's an attractor, the dog's an attractor, where they overlap or there's similarities, right? You can jump. I mean, like, the way you represent data in your brain is just like a web of interconnected things. Like, you can just, the train of thought, you can just carry it from one thought to another thought to another thought to another thought. You're invoking attractors, exploring the space a little, grabbing a subset of it, invoking another attractor, exploring the space a little, grabbing, invoking another attractor. That's how your thought process is going through, sort of keep holding things in your brain as you like think through ideas, for example. This most likely happens in the prefrontal cortex. That's like your working memory. It's not linear. It's not linear, no, no, definitely not. There's not much in your brain that's linear. <laughs> uh, yeah? Uh, I have too many questions. But, uh... <laughs> well, I don't mind staying. I don't know if Jim's gonna kick us out at some point. So you said in the beginning how imposing space and time is for, for intelligence. How does it work with an AGI system? Like if it's embedded on a ship? Well, like, again, there is no AGI system in computers today, <laughs> period. Right. It doesn't work. We, we only know this from studying biology. Okay. Um, and a lot of this is theory. You know, we, we're not certain. There's a lot of experiments, that point, uh, ex, uh, experiments and evidence that points toward this, but we don't really know. I don't think you can ever do that. No, not physical space. If you, it has to be able to move. I don't think. So here's the thing. It could be virtual movement. It could be virtual movement. You could you could make a smart web crawler, for example. You could give it. Uh, it has an environment. It starts at the URL and it, then it scans a page and it looks for links. Its movement could be choosing a link to go next. You know that could be a movement. That's a movement through the internet space. So there's lots of ways you might define moving through space. It doesn't have to be bound to. Physics, it doesn't have to be bound to uh, simulation of physics. It could, all you need is an environment that you can move through. <laughs> you know? it, it, you just, and moving, I just mean change your perspective. You have to have a sensor that's receiving information in some environment and the ability to change its perspective of the environment. That's the first thing you need to start being intelligent. That could be done dynamically on a case by case basis. What you can do it with 34. Three stones? Okay. <laughs> using... Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you have, as far as the immensity, do you have anything applied yet on the motion and the uh, location cell aspect? So, yeah, actually, on the grid cell part, um, we did, uh, we have a paper called uh, How Does the Neocortex Create a Sensory Motor Model of the World? I think that's the paper. Um, and. So actually, go to nimensa.com slash papers, and you'll see all of them. Um, the, and the one that has like hands and fingers touching things, that's the one. Because <laughs> uh, we did, we mapped, we mocked out um, a, a cortical column. Well, I won't bring it up, but we, you know, you saw the diagram of a cortical column. We, we think that like certain layers representing uh, this type of space, and other layers representing space in this way, and this is how they're communicating. And together, we, you have to inject movement into the system somehow. Like, in your brain, your cortex is generating uh, motor output everywhere in the cortex, like your whole cortex, which has confused neuroscientists for, for decades. But that motor output is like, you're, you're, it's your predicted state of the world. It's where you think you're gonna be, you know, in, in the next uh, moment. Um, and we, we don't have, uh, we, we don't really know how that works. Like nobody knows how it works. <laughs> yeah. Along that line, I read a book a while ago by Lisa Barrett. Have you ever heard of her? Lisa Feldman Barrett. Yes. Uh, and there was a test that that that, that, that they had brain map, and their the hypothesis was you're going to show a snake come in the room, the visual part would go hop, and then your arm would get ready to act. Yeah. And they found that the arm fired up. Yeah. Before the visual part. Absolutely. Is that is has that been tested or? Well, yeah. So there's so there's 
artifacts of artifacts of evolution in your genes that um, that express themselves to create your brain, essentially. Um, some of these artifacts are really, really old and ancient. So you might have something genetically encoded into some part of your subcortical structure to recognize something that looks vaguely like a snake, right? And, and would invoke some fear response. Everybody's afraid of snakes and spiders. But pretty yeah, before the visual. Before part. the cortex even gets involved, it's almost a reflex a subcortical sort circuit. Did they get one more little addition on another one? They put the snake behind the door. Uh huh. And arm reacted as it gets ready, and the snake hadn't gotten in the room yet. Now, that was in the book, and I would be very interested to know if that's been researched or looked at, because it's kind of, it means there's some kind of sensory input that human beings have mm -hmm. that we react to, which will affect everything that you're testing. Well, I don't, I don't know. Unknown, I wouldn't take it like that. This I, unknown piece. Your brain is constantly pattern matching, not just in the neocortex, but in all other parts of your brains. It's, it's trying to resolve to certain patterns. And if a pat, it, when sensory input comes in, it makes a stop in the thalamus before it projects all the way out to the cortex. How does that and brain get the input with the snake behind it? Like I said, the snake in your car right now. Right. How do you know what there is no snake in your car right now? <laughs> I think I think his point is just there's some some stimulus that short circuits the cortex and gets an immediate motion response without the cortex being involved. Because I was saying that motor outputs everywhere in cortex. Your your cortex can't control everything. Try and hold your breath until you die. <laughs> you can't. I mean, because uh, there's subcortical processes that will take over. You know, so that's an example of something like that, very primal, some type of fear of dangerous reptile that could be expressing itself in your genes at a very low level. Any other? Thank you. So reinforcement learning has one great thing going for it. It it allows you to get movement into the loop, but you still have to have this loss function that. So model-free reinforcement learning I don't think will work. I think you have to have a model of reality, and perhaps this is a way forward with something more like the brain. If we can get a reinforcement learning system to uh, have agency in some environment and build a model based upon that. The tricky thing is, and I, this is again sort of me speculating about this, I think the tricky thing when you try and do that is that the, the model itself has to generate something that is causal to movement. And that's the tricky thing. If you're going to take deliberate action in the world, planned action, something that comes from an object representation of cortex. So if your cortex doesn't just have models of every object, it has models of all the movements and interactions that you take with those objects. Right? The way you model objects is very closely tied with how you interact with them. Um, so the model needs to be able to contribute to the strategy of the reinforcement learning system. I don't know how to do that. Yes? Do you have any, any little kids you work with? I have two kids. Uh, so you, yeah, so it's like they have a bunch of blocks. I bet you can buy lots of interesting cheap blocks. And <laughs> yeah, it was. Re it's really interesting watching children learn when you're thinking about the brain all the time, for sure. And, and a, a couple of tips that I got from this. If you're trying to learn something, any way that you can incorporate movement into the learning is helpful. No matter what, if it seems silly, like the, when people tell you to just take notes for no reason, take notes for no reason, it's helpful. If, even if you just throw them away on your way out the door. Just the act of moving, in, in that, during that episodic memory, it's, it's a reinforcement of what's happening at the time, and you're more likely to remember it if you've got more sensory involvement and more motor involvement in the, in the situation. So when you say that, uh the brain uses very sparse computing, let's say. What happens to the other parts of the brain that are not used at that time? So, so you think about neurons like this. A neuron, one single neuron means absolutely nothing. You can take a neuron out of the brain and it will never affect anything. A neuron will fire, and if you're just looking at a neuron firing as you're watching a brain, it's completely random patterns. Like you, there's no way you can associate that neuron with anything. You have to look at the brain as a population of, of neurons all the time. It has no meaning unless you look at the entire population of neurons. Does that make sense? 
I don't know if I answered the question though. <laughs> Maybe a related question that if you have those chips that do sparse computing, is there really kind of similar way like you're only using 10% of that chip? Um, well, okay. sort of, but you're not really just using 2% of your brain. You're, you're representing something with 2% of your brain. You're sim the, the simulation is vast, okay? All of those neurons are used for something. You might not have thought about that book by Camp that you read eight years ago, but it's in there somewhere. You have thoughts about it somewhere. Maybe you haven't exercised that population of neurons recently, but you could probably figure out a way to invoke it in your mind. That, those neurons aren't wasted. They're used in all of the representations. Every neuron could be used in, in thousands of different representations, right? So you're, it's not being wasted. It's just got a low level of activity. The, the simulation has huge memory banks. What's actually lighting up in the simulation is just an indication of what's currently active. And would that be what the other sensors are conscious mind? That's a tricky question. So it depends. Um, and I don't know if I want to get into consciousness right now, because <laughs> I could talk for another hour, but I probably shouldn't. I was okay. going to ask about mindfulness, but I don't think that we'd be here for a long time. I can talk to you later. I do mindfulness meditation. I think it helps. Uh, yeah. You've been talking about uh, human brains, uh, or mammal brains, and I, I, I've been actually looking into different types of brains. Uh, is there different branches in the evolution? What? There's definitely different branches. Um, so I think other interesting brains, I think bird brains are interesting, mollusk brains, like cuttlefish, octopus are very smart. Um, dolphins, whales are very smart, but we don't study them. I think it's, it's much, much easier to study primates I think because neuroscientists have a history of studying them. Like, <laughs> like most of the brain studies are on mice or, or macaque monkeys or pigs sometimes. <laughs> yes? When you started this evening asking about what is uh, intelligence, there was some interesting research recently released from Harvard about single cell organisms called Stentor rosselli. And they get to make a choice when things irritate them <coughs> on which direction they move themselves. Yeah, yeah, so it's similar to what That's I was talking about. The right? primordial stuff. Yeah, I mean, where do, you, it's, where do you draw the line? Yeah. So I do think that there's certainly a difference between intelligence and consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think that both of them have a spectrum involved. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some cases you can be one without the other. I think a lot of people think single cell organisms don't really have much of anything going yeah. on in them. And the people body. also think they're not conscious. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, the more I learn about the brain, the more questions I have about these things. I mean, maybe plants are conscious. Maybe rocks are conscious. I don't actually think rocks are conscious. <laughs> but there is like panpsychism, right? That, that, that people do think everything's conscious. But I think it's sort of ridiculous. <laughs> uh, okay. I think maybe you should try talking to, to rocks. No. Try talking regularly to one favorite frog. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. I, there's definitely studies on plants where they will play different types of music for different plants, and it certainly has an effect. Plants don't like death metal. <laughs> and maybe it's because of vibrational effects, or maybe not. There's also studies that if you put a seed in earth, even without uh, a sense of gravity, and you play the sound of water, the seed will grow towards the sound of water. That's crazy. How does that, nobody knows how that works, but apparently that's a thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, how does that, there's lots of unanswered questions, so. Uh, okay, any, any last questions? Thanks, you guys, everybody. For, you can stick around. I'll talk to you. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.